So in this video, we're gonna talk about this quick performance four wheel disc brake conversion that I did. Now, I ordered this quick performance kit, uh, including the rear end, uh, the axle housing, and uh, the brake kit all as one. But you can buy the brake kit on its own online from Quick Performance in Iowa. Uh, this particular kit uh, sells for, I think, $375 or somewhere around in there. It contains the calipers with the parking brake assembly on it, the rotors, the brackets, which are bolt-on in this particular case, uh, and uh, the backing plate. So what's my experience with four-wheel disc brake conversions? Why might you want to do it? Uh, what's my experience with quick performance, hidden costs, all of that kind of stuff. Well, first of all, the quick performance kit has been pretty good um, for what it was. First of all, I wanted a bolt-on four-wheel disc brake conversion because I wanted it to be reversible in case I didn't like them, whatever the case may be. I always like reversible modifications more than I like permanent modifications. The Weldon kit was a little bit less expensive, um, but honestly, I like the option of bolt-on. There were other options like the Explorer brake kit, which wasn't a direct fit for the factory parking brake cable, uh, which is still connected back here, and I didn't like that option. More parts, more incompatibility, more or less. And there's also things uh, like the Willwood conversions, which are very, very pricey. So I chose this quick performance bolt-on uh, conversion as part of my uh, Ford rear end assembly and setup. So the first thing that I can say is it goes on pretty easy, to be honest. It bolts right on on these brackets. You can position the caliper uh, in one of four different spots. You can have it here, you can have it here, uh, basically at, at quarters. And this is kind of the top mount location. Now the top mount like location like this, it's, it's preferred for me because you can directly connect that parking brake cable to it. That means you can use the factory parking brake and that was really important. Uh, one of the things that's a problem with this location though is the bleeder on these calipers is located uh, facing kind of halfway forward, halfway up on the caliper, the bleeder screw is towards the front of the car. This means it's not possible to bleed the brakes with the caliper mounted on the bracket on the car. In fact, I had to unmount the caliper, angle it upwards so that bleeder screw was at the top point in order to get the air out of the line. And there are a couple different ways to bleed it. I actually had so many issues bleeding and so many issues with the system in general that I bought a power bleeder. Now, the rotors and the calipers that came with the kit uh, they weren't marked with anything. The calipers especially, no casting numbers, uh, no marks whatsoever, and that indicates two things to me. Number one, whoever made it doesn't want their name on it, and that's, that's a warning that you might not be getting a very high quality part. Uh, and number two, I was gonna have to go through quick performance if I wanted replacement parts. And in fact, both the rear calipers here, they did fail within five years. Uh, inside the piston caliper. It had some rust buildup and of course the corrosion caused uh, brake fluid to leak on this side. I replaced just this side. That was quite the endeavor. Uh, and uh, the other side failed shortly thereafter the caliper was hanging up after a micro of storage. And that brings me to the problem that I had with the kit was I didn't know where in the world these calipers came from. When you buy kits like this, it's very rare that you're going to have a purpose built caliper for you know an aftermarket application and I called quick performance up and I got somebody on the other end of the line after a few attempts with tech support and they said the calipers were going to be coming off of a 1978 Cadillac Eldorado so I ordered a caliper rebuild kit because those particular calipers were impossible to find at the time and the caliper rebuild kit did not fit at all that's obviously an issue and that led me to online searching. I could have called Quick Performance back, but to be honest, the response that I got on the, the phone after a few attempts was I was bugging somebody. They really didn't particularly care to talk to me, and they gave me inaccurate information. 
so you know take it for what it's worth now I did discover that these are so the same as 1985 Cadillac Seville uh, rear uh, brake calipers and it took some searching on the internet but that's what I did find so I documented that for my record uh, and the rotors same thing but they've been custom drilled uh, to mount for this five lug pattern nothing special there and of course the bracket is made I'm sure in-house by quick performance everything else was fine the pads that came with the setup also unmarked and literally fell apart let me show you so this is one of the brake pads uh, to the side that was leaking fluid and I wound up replacing that caliper when I found out what it was uh, using a uh, a caliper from Napa because they had one in stock and I put this pad back on it seemed okay I cleaned it up sure there was a little bit of brake fluid on it uh, but like I said it, it cleaned up nice the Napa caliper also failed later on uh, just happens to be you know the, the order of the business I guess and there was a little bit more brake fluid that must have gotten onto this pad but what tripped me off that there was a problem in the first place was that and uh, you might not be able to see very well but here we go there's still some pad material it simply separated and fell apart when I hit the brakes one day all of a sudden I didn't have good brakes it was like before I did the four-wheel disc conversion and um, or sorry before I did the hydro boost conversion so no good it sent me in to look at what had gone on and that's when I discovered this chunk of material uh, was just gone I found it later in the garage so of course that brings me to, you know, the Q&A sort of for myself in terms of whether or not I would want to do a four-wheel disc brake conversion uh, to one of these classic Mustangs. What does four-wheel disc really give you? Well, obviously there's a cool factor and that's all great. Four-wheel discs or rear disc brakes are certainly better than drum brakes, but why is that? Well, there are probably about four major reasons. Uh, the first one is improved performance in terms of brake fade. Drums don't do well at dispersing heat. Disc brakes, the rotors, have basically a, a vented rotor, has a built-in fan, and that gets rid of a lot of heat. That heat is a problem in two ways. First of all, for the friction material itself, once it hits about six or seven hundred degrees, it's going to start essentially vaporizing and that gas layer is going to prevent uh, the pad from contacting the surface, the machine surface of the brake rotor or the brake drum. That gives you a feel that you've lost, well, you have lost brake contact. It doesn't stop as well. Brake fade option number one. Number two is, like in this classic car, uses DOT3 brake fluid. That boils at 400 degrees. Now, on a caliper, it's exposed out there in the wind, out there in the air, uh, next to a, a disc that's blowing air around. It helps cool that caliper down, keeps the brake fluid cooler. Not the case inside of a drum where the wheel cylinder lives. It's basically surrounded and encased in an extremely hot environment with no airflow or limited airflow. Drum brakes essentially rely on radiate heat to get rid of uh, that excess heat. So on a drum brake system, much more prone to uh, brake fade because of boiling. Now, in terms of true stopping power, you're not getting a huge advantage with discs. As far as the rear brakes go, drum versus disc, either one of them will lock up the rear tires if they're functioning properly. Drum brakes have plenty of stopping power. The problem with them is modulation. And not necessarily that the drum is so much heavier than the disc rotor, people will talk about inertia, but it's really about leverage. Uh, when you look at a drum brake system or shoes, and I don't have any around here, but you get something that looks like this with a wheel cylinder at the top. And when that wheel cylinder pushes out, you've got all of this leverage down here and all the way uh, halfway across. That means you're dealing with a leverage multiplier. And that means the feel at the pedal isn't as clear. It's over boosted steering almost like in a way. So with all of that extra leverage it's really really hard to determine where that lockup point is and stop just short of it. Also consider the fact that 
But if you lock up the rear tires, it's not the end of the world in terms of stopping distance. You're only getting 20 or maybe 30% of your stopping power from the rear brakes to begin with. If you add a, you know, 10 feet to the total stop, it's usually not going to be the deciding factor. So consider that. So it's not pure stopping power that you're looking for. The problem isn't stopping faster, it's stopping more control. Drum brakes are really hard to modulate, so sometimes you're going to get lock up, and once you do, it's gonna be impossible for you to hold the brakes uh, at a point just before lock up. You're not gonna be able to back off and then put those brakes back on and, and hold them. That means the rear wheels stay locked. When the rear wheels are locked and the fronts are braking hard and not locked, well, the back end is going to want to become the front end of the car. So if that back end starts to kick out into a different lane of traffic, you're going to be potentially forced to let up entirely off the brakes to get it back in line to hit the brakes again. And that can cause issues. That's the primary stopping improvement that you're going to see. Pedal feel, obviously much better with discs because you don't have that multiplier effect. You get better feedback. In addition, you've got some wet weather issues with drums, just minor annoyance. They have a tendency to be really grippy when it's wet out. You've got that big drum surface area that's contained uh, inside the drum, holds moisture, gets a little bit of surface rust. Most drums can get really grabby for the first few applications basically a minor inconvenience. Drums are also significantly more difficult to work on, uh, drum brakes are, than disc brakes. But it's kind of offset by the complexities of parking brakes and for whatever reason, how difficult it was for manufacturers to make a caliper that basically uh, allows you to adjust that parking brake easily. So those are a whole bunch of you know, medium to small issues uh, with drum brakes that you can solve by going to disc brakes. The biggest issue and the reason why I strongly recommend against, against anyone doing a four-wheel disc brake conversion to a classic Mustang, especially 67 through 70, is it's not compatible with your braking system. This is a power brake booster from Master Power Brakes. It's a kit, came with a master cylinder, and it said that it's good for uh, both uh, front disc, rear drum, and four wheel disc. It is not. This will not work with four wheel disc. And it's not just a, a bad booster or a bad master cylinder. This is also a brand new booster I used to replace uh, this. Didn't improve it. Replace master cylinders, replace distribution blocks, replace proportioning valves, uh, bled the brakes enough to the point where, you know, I bought a power bleeder, um, and that's, I can show you that in the box over here. That's this guy, which is actually an awesome little tool to pull this thing out. Uh, this thing works absolutely awesome. If you're by yourself, you need to bleed brakes. Uh, basically, you just pump this thing up, it builds a pressure. There's uh, different blocks that go over the top of the master cylinder, and uh, you put brake fluid in here, and it refills the master as you're bleeding. You don't have to worry about brake level and uh, you know, it just makes bleeding and, uh, so much easier. Let's set this over to the side. Now, I also had the brakes professionally bled uh, several times, never had good brakes. So you might be saying, well, you know, hey, that 427 only makes eight inches of vacuum at idle, what do you expect? And that's true. However, it does make uh, 22 inches of vacuum at, I think, 2000 RPM. Still, I bought an electric uh, CVR racing uh, vacuum pump. Didn't fix the problem. So I bought a reservoir in case I didn't have enough vacuum. Didn't fix the problem. The bottom line is this Midland style or the Bendix style dual eight inch diaphragm boosters that are on the 67 to 70 Mustangs, they're not up to the task of disc brakes. Disc brakes require way more pressure, twice as much pressure, and they require more fluid. And why? Again, remember that leverage effect that you've got. It only takes about 600 PSI of pressure to operate a drum brake system. Uh, 800 is more than enough for even a racing application. For disc brakes, 
you're not going to get anything until 1200 and you should have more like 1500 psi all that extra pressure and a big piston in those calipers means more fluid to push it your braking system in a classic mustang just not built for it now the nine inch pancake style boosters that came with automatic transmissions are supposed to be quite a bit better they don't fit on a manual car i can't say for certain they won't work but i certainly wouldn't trust them now, if you have a manual brake car, the pedal's gonna be way too stiff if you try to do four wheel disc. It's not gonna be appropriate for daily driving. Uh, you might be able to get away with it on a racetrack if you have a nice strong leg, but it's, it's just not gonna be up to the task on driving comfortably on the road. Plus the master cylinder is going to need to be swapped because the master cylinder on a manual brake system isn't up to the task of pushing enough fluid. So if you convert to a system that like Master Power will say will work, it's not gonna work. You're gonna spend a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of time diagnosing like I did. Eventually I went to Hydro Boost, solved the issue, and it was awesome. But keep in mind, Hydro Boost is not free. These uh, brake conversions and everything that I spent into it, you can be booking thousands of additional dollars in your brake system. Uh, for Hydro Boost, if you don't have power steering, you need to add that. It's, it's a big expense that you might not expect. So one of the things that I wanted to add was, I mentioned a few times that I didn't have good brakes. So what is not good brakes and how do I know it's the power brake booster just not being strong enough uh, versus something else? And this power brake booster has a push rod here at the back and a, an adapter for the pedal along with an input shaft on the front that goes into the master cylinder. Now what I would have is nice feeling brakes, a nice feeling brake pedal, linear, didn't feel spongy, just felt like a nice boosted brake pedal. Only nothing would happen for about halfway down that pedal. And then suddenly the brakes would immediately get firm. And I mean not spongy, just firm. Uh, the pedal wasn't super duper hard, but it was much stiffer than I felt like it should be. And that's where braking started. It wasn't a problem on the freeway or on the highway uh, where the brakes would apply and they would come on pretty, pretty well. And it would build, uh, the pressure in the brakes would definitely build, it would stop pretty well. It was in the panic stop situation uh, where it seemed like it took time for the brakes to kick in. Now this is the vacuum port. Uh, this is where vacuum gets sucked through the, uh, the power brake booster and this dual diaphragm one, the entire area is under vacuum. And when you hit the pedal a little bit, what's happening is it seals off the front from the back. Only the front part has vacuum and that pulls those diaphragms forward as you depress the brake pedal. That's where the power brake boosting comes from. Now, if it's not strong enough, this uh, input shaft, or sorry, this uh, push rod pushes into the power brake booster. You've got all this boost happening, but the input shaft into the master cylinder doesn't move or doesn't move enough. And eventually the push rod comes into contact with that input shaft and essentially you have manual brakes with a little bit of, uh, of boost there. Um, and that's what I was getting. In fact, I did lock up the brakes at one point on a panic stop, and what happened was this push rod end piece literally got bent 90 degrees down. So the back brakes were connected, they were working, but the booster was not supplying nearly enough uh, brake assist. That's how I know. So yes, now my brakes are awesome, would I have done four wheel disc brakes had I known what it was gonna send me through? No way, I would have stuck with the rear drums all day, every day. Because when it comes down to it, how often are you really locking up your brakes? Once every five years maybe? A couple times every five years? And did it ever make a difference? Did it? Did that 10 feet from 60 miles per hour make a difference between you running into somebody or not? Probably not. So that's my piece of advice on that. 